Okay. Family related. My grandfather. A father was his brother. And he was uh, born and raised in uh, Jerusalem. And he was the guy that uh, received the uh, alibi in uh, 1917, December 1917. So that's why I'm showing you that. So you see, we have relations here. So thank you for that. So now we are going to the real thing. Uh, after giving you a little uh, background, on Israel. Uh, by the way, Allenby uh, was a uh, owner in Israel, and there are some streets. You see Tel Aviv, the main street in Tel Aviv, Allenby Street. Also, there is Allenby Square in Jerusalem, and uh, you receive the tour, and there is Allenby Park in Be'er Sheva. So, you see how important he was in Israel. Also, the Allenby Bridge between us and uh, Jordan. This is the border crossing on the Jordan. Okay, we go now to the Yom Kippur War. Uh, do you know what is uh, Yom Kippur? Is what? Again, please. Yom Kippur is the oldest day in the, in the, in the, in the holidays in Israel. Uh, yes, some of the people are fasting because this is the day uh, the uh, people, the Orthodox, I mean, the religious people, are asking forgiveness from God for all the bad things they have done during there. They can do a lot of things, a lot of bad things, and then get the forgiveness. <laughs> you know, in one, in one day, they have to fast and so on. Uh, yeah, let's say 15-20% of the, even if people who even are not uh, religious are fasting. Uh, myself, I didn't fast then during the war. In the, the last 10 years, I'm fasting myself only for, I think it's good for the health. So that's why I'm doing it. So it's 24 hours of fast. It's not, it's not bad. And, uh, and this is holiday that everything in Israel is stopped. There is no media, there are no car, car moving. Everything is closed. Radio, television, everything is lost. And the Egyptians and the Syrians, uh, rightly and also wrongly, uh, I'll tell you why, uh, decided to attack Israel during that day. Everybody were at home. There was no media, no television. The attack started on Friday, the 6th of October, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, I, I'll give you some uh, background on me. I, I was uh, graduated, the, uh, I graduated the military school in Haifa, the uh, Reali school, one of the best schools in Haifa. It's attached to, to the, the high school. And uh, we did uh, three years in the military schools from 15 years old to 18 years old. Then you, you join the army, you choose where you, you want to go. And I chose to go to the, to the armor, uh, to the tanks. and. Uh, and after three years, you, uh, you get in as a corporal, but you do a short uh, procedure, I mean, so a short uh, uh, program uh, to be uh, an officer. So within nine months, we, we became an officer, and we, uh, we continue with our uh, careers. Okay, so uh, just uh, to give a little history, uh, history, so first of all, this is our graduation ceremony with uh, Rabin, who was the chief of staff and then prime minister, and now he was assassinated. This is the school manager, and he's, here is a young uh, Chaim Danon here. And these are my colleagues. We started uh, uh, 55, we finished 23 uh, candidates, and uh, we are left now 14 after the wars and uh, so on. So these are uh, my group. They are, I mean, one of the, the best, uh, let's say, period of my life. It was there when you are really uh, uh, going and uh, establish yourself and so on. Okay, uh, uh, in 1966, the Britain, o the, uh, the, uh, Britain offered Israel a deal in which that Israel will help the uh, British to develop the Chieftain tank. It was under uh, uh, development and uh, in the meantime, we will buy 
from Britain 250 tanks, centurions, all tanks. Uh, the British economy was very bad that time, by the way, 1966. And uh, we helped, you know, we were only 18 years old country and we bought 250 tanks, which is a lot of money then. And, uh, and the agreement was also that the British will help us to build a line to build the tanks in Israel, the chieftain tanks. And uh, the army were looking for officers to be sent to, to be trained to be trained in England, and I was choosing one of the uh, of the four of us. These are my colleagues, also a, uh, my uh, classmates from the military school, uh, Ode Deres, uh, rest in peace, Muki uh, Carney, myself, Chaim Danon, and uh, Chaim Barak. Uh, both of them were uh, battalion commanders during the war, uh, like me. Uh, Chaim Barak became a brigadier general, uh, left the, uh, the army. Uh, Ode Deres was also lieutenant colonel, but he, he was died in, the, in one of the, uh, uh, let's say, exercise uh, accidents in the Negev. Okay, so we were sent to England. Uh, I was, uh, we were taken out from the company. After one year, we were taken out from the company uh, course commanders. Uh, and we were sent to England for two months. We came to uh, Wareham, near uh, Bovington. We stayed in the Red Lion Hotel, which I understood yesterday, I mean last week, I was told that it was closed down just recently. And we were put in, a, in a one room, four of us, uh, where the bathroom is in the end of the corridor. And as in England, you know, the taps are very close you know, to the walls. So we are used as Israeli to do showers, you know, and a lot of water every day. It was an experience. Every day we were taken by a van into the Bovington and larve of a larve of a, a, a camp. We were trained on the chieftain. We came with a civilian a civilian a, a, a dress, put an overall in a closed a shade, and it was a very secret a, operation because. Uh, during that time, there were a lot of uh, 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 Arab uh, officers were trained in uh, Bovington and Larvo from Libya, from uh, Algeria, and other countries, and so on. And that time, you know, it was very sensitive, and the British didn't want, everybody didn't want the Arabs to know that we are helping you to develop, and also you will sell us uh, this uh, chieftain modern and developed tank. Uh, so this is, by the way, the chieftain. Uh, I made a presentation uh, uh, two months ago to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, our Armour Corp uh, uh, forum in Latoun. You were yesterday in Latoun in the hall, because we celebrated in December 40 years to Merkava. So the Merkava was introduced to, uh, uh, to the Israeli army, and today the whole army is, uh, the whole uh, uh, Armour Corp is Merkava, is equipped with Merkava. Uh, we celebrated 40 years, and I call this session the chieftain that gave, bre uh, gave uh, birth to the Merkava. Why? Because after the experience that we, we bought the tanks, we bought four tanks into Israel in 1966, and we trained, uh, we did the experiments in tank in the desert, driving, shooting, uh, all kinds of environments, even closing the, uh, the hats, and, uh, and uh, three days, and with even air conditioning, which was stuck after three days because of the dust, the, uh, the engines were blown up after uh, 100 hours because of the dust, and our engineers helped you, I mean, uh, to design, to redesign the filtration system, and this was done by your people, came back. We had here five uh, engineers, by the way, uh, added, added by uh, a major, from the Armour Corp, and uh, they were with us uh, all those years. And uh, yeah, we did a lot of changes, so 150 changes, including uh, increasing the belly uh, uh, storage from 48 uh, uh, rounds to 70, 70, 72, 70, 72 rounds. So uh, after we have done that, I'm, sh I'm making short all the story because all this took something like four years. In the meantime, there was a six-day war. The British took the telescope power, so we didn't use the tank. We were participating in the war in Jerusalem. Our uh, team, uh, 
the unit was a closed unit. Uh, nobody could uh, come in. And uh, yeah, in 1969, we were called after the tanks went out and back with all the improvements. Uh, we were called by the, the chief of the armor corp, then Talik, General Talik. We call him Talik, is, uh, we call him Mr. Armor, because he's really a tank, a tank designer and commander, and he's very, very famous. And uh, he passed away, by the way, something like two, three years ago. And uh, Talik called us and said, look, the British are boycotting us and are not going to sell us the tank. But within five years, we will have our own tank. So due to you, we have one of the best tanks today, the Merkava, due to you. I mean, the British, uh, the best tank in the, uh, in the world, which is the Merkava uh, 4. Uh, uh, what we didn't know then, what, that we know now, that the, your cabinet decided one year before they told us, decided not to sell us the tank and also to try to convince the Americans not to sell us the Peton. They didn't know that at the same time we had some uh, other officers training on the Peton. Anyway, so we bought the, the Peton uh, already uh, uh, participated in the Six Day War. And uh, Entalic, the general, also helped Britain to sell the, uh, the chieftain. It was very, very big success. Help them and convince the Iranians. We were in very good relations then with the Iranians. And uh, a, uh, Talik really convinced the Iranians to buy the chieftain. And the first brigade that we were, the, the first brigade that we were supposed to receive by the end of '69 went to Iran, with all the innovations against the agreement, by the way, because the innovations has to be kept uh, only for us. All the uh, the uh, the changes we made to to the tank. Anyway, this is the history. And that's why we have today the Merkava. So this is this part, and now we're going to 679 Brigade at last. I need something to refresh my throat. Tada. OK, 679 Brigade was founded in 1970 because of the, uh, due to the necessity to add a, uh, one more brigade in the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights, you will see in a minute what happened. These were the, the three uh, first uh, uh, battalion commanders or the others that you have seen before, my, my uh, uh, classmate, uh, Chaim uh, Barak, also my classmate, and Avigdor uh, Kaalani. Uh, I was his second in command. Uh, and this was uh, what he called a, an emergency nomination. They were in a, in a high course in the army. And in the meantime, if there is an emergency, if there is a war, they are, they are uh, commanding, they, uh, they are nominated to command, let's say, battalions, the reserve. By the way, the reserves in Israel, I mean, the 75% the of the force of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, is in the reserve. I mean, when there is a war, we have to use the reserve. So everybody in Israel, you have to know, it's a compulsory for them to, to have a three years service. If they want to stay further, they can stay further. They have to sign and stay further, go to a, a, a let's say, officer course, and they do their careers in the army. And if you are not, or if you are released from the army anyway, and there are reserve units, the reserve units is uh, uh, you have a camp, you have your own tank, you have your own people, and they are all assigned, you know, to the one, to the one place. So when we created, we founded this, uh, the, the 679 uh, uh, brigade, there were all uh, uh, crews coming from uh, the, the uh, regular re brigades, uh, uh, seven, uh, Brigade 7, Brigade 188. Okay, there were two uh, 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 brigades, uh, 7 and 188, uh, those times that were supplying the people who were after the army to go to the reserve. And when you are in the reserve, you have to know also that you are also 
a call to the army every year for at least four to eight weeks, every year. So you can imagine what happens if you are a sales manager in a company, a civilian, and you are called uh, and, uh, and you are taken out of the company. Uh, you have to understand when the government has to take to, uh, to call for the reserve, they have to think carefully because this is really a damage to the economy. You understand that, okay? So we are too small and uh, let's say not very rich to hold a full army like maybe others. So we have a reserve and this is, uh, this is the, more or less the system. Uh, we had the first, uh, the first uh, uh, the first training in the desert, in the Negev, and, uh, and the layout of the, uh, the, the training was crossing the Swiss Canal, not the Golan at all. This is the ceremony, but uh, this is the brigade, the first brigade commando. This is uh, Kalani, this is me. So, here I am, 21, 24 years old. Okay, 679 exists still today on the Golan. Still here with the Merkava tank. The two tanks that took part in the, uh, in the, in the Golan battle was the Centurion British Meteor, the original Meteor, a, uh, what we call Meteor uh, engine, and the new uh, tank that we re-innovated uh, re uh, by changing all the power terrain. I mean, the engine transmission and the steering, everything we changed and gave it, we call it Chotkal, which is a light, a light. So, it's uh, when you, when I uh, you have to describe it, it's like going from, uh, let's say, Deshvo. You know what's a Deshvo? Used to be a Citroen, uh, you know, Deshvo, two horsepower. Uh, and you go to a Mercedes, a uh, fire runner. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, really a speedy tank, very, uh, uh, very light and, and, and reacts uh, different from the old, old Citroens. But when we started the war, Iron Brigade was equipped with this tank, with the metal, and they were supposed to go for uh, re-innovation, uh, you know, in our uh, workshops. Okay, three months before the war, the Northern commander took a decision to move two brigades closer to the Syrian, to the Syrian border. We were stationed, the two brigades, reserve brigades were here, near the Haifa, Haifa shore, and we were here also in Yokneam, and the two brigades were moved to Filon and Iftach. We were moved to a, a camp, which was only open shades, no ele electricity, no water, open tunnels, it was not ready, because there was a valuation in June 1973 that there will be a war. So this movement really saved Israel. This, is a vital, this was a vital decision, you know, that uh, the Northern commander took and really saved Israel. Had we we were, uh, had we uh, 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 had to wait uh, uh, 10 hours, we would have lost the Golanite. So look what he did. 10 hours, we saved 10 hours of drive, and we were close to the bridges uh, one hour. Okay? Now we call this bridge a uh, not Yaakov bridge, which is daughters of Jacob. I call it just. Jacob Bridge, okay, short, and this is Arig Bridge uh, down here. This is the Sea of Galilee, and when you go to the Golan, you have to climb, you have to cross the bridge because you, you, you cross the Jordan. To show you that it's not really was, it, it was not really a surprise, as uh, people attend, as the media attend, uh, to say two weeks before the war, Hussein, the King Hussein, came to Golda and uh, really told her that the Egyptians and the, uh, and the Syrians are planning an attack on Israel within two weeks. So we knew that. I mean, we had, we had all the signs. Okay, what we, uh, we did just before the war, when there was an alert, uh, Brigade 7 was moved from Sina to, uh, to the Golanite, and Brigade a uh, 460 was positioned in Sinai. Okay, and uh, and and, uh, and uh, 
the, the Golan, in the Golan Age, the forces were prepared for a day battle. Not really for, they didn't know until two o'clock on Saturday, they didn't know that they are going to, to, uh, to, have, uh, to be prepared for a war, a long war. Okay, uh, the preparation before the war, uh, on Friday, the 5th of October, there was an high, highest alert in all the army, all the vacations were, uh, were stopped, they were called, I mean all the regular army were called back. And uh, this is, by the way, a, a, a picture from our camp in Iftach, close to the Jordan. The IDF a, a Air Force was prepared for a preemptive attack. What it means? You know, in the, in the Six Day War, we destroyed the, uh, the, the, Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian Air Force within one hour when we started the war, and then, and then really uh, the war was, uh, uh, was finished then. There was a one-day battle and the rest was, uh, you know, chasing uh, and driving to the Suez uh, Canal. So here we were ready to have a preemptive attack. But Golda Meir, our prime minister, and uh, Moshe Dayan, our uh, uh, defense uh, minister, uh, took a decision not to have this preemptive attack. Why? Because they didn't want to, uh, to be seen by uh, the Americans that we started the war. But this, of course, caused us a lot of casualties because of that. And uh, till today, we have a really argument if it was a good decision or not. Okay, the, the, the Navy uh, went out to the open sea and the reserve forces, 75% of the force of Israel, were at home at 2 o'clock. I was at home. I was second in command uh, of the brigade, reserve brigade, that moved very close, you know, to the Golan, and I didn't know anything. I was at home. It was Yom Kippur. I saw some, uh, I saw some uh, let's say, strange movements of army cars, which is strange, you know, during uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, but at 2 o'clock, we heard the siren uh, uh, goes on, ups and downs. When it's up and it means that you have to go to the shelters. So everybody went into the shelters. I tried to find out what is going on. I opened the radio, everything was closed. But, you know, was my uh, intelligence who told me about the war? The BBC. I opened the BBC. The BBC said, war started in Israel. The forces in the Golan didn't know, by the way, didn't know that there is a war. You know, in front of them. BBC told us there is a war. I knew that something is wrong. I am at home and uh, I have to be, you know, in my uh, unit. I didn't have telephone. Then we had to, fight, to wait for the telephone in 1973 for the telephone, seven years. I waited for seven years to get to, to have a telephone in my home. Now it's seven seconds. So you understand that I had to go to find a telephone. So I went, to, I went on my car, everybody was in the shelters. I drove five, ten minutes to my uh, parents', parents house. They were uh, living in the fourth floor of the building in Tel Aviv. Everybody were in the shelters. I went up, I uh, called my uh, unit, they said, come with me. Today. By the way, the warrant there, the warrant to my house arrived at midnight. I was in the camp, it was 2.30. I left home, quarter to four, I was in the camp in the Golan, I mean in, the, in, the, in Iftach. When I arrived to Iftach, I drove like a hell, you know, the empty, empty roads with my car. I took another colleague together with me. When we arrived to the camp, there were only, only commanders, the uh, brigade commander, Orio, and some other commanders. And we were listening in an open uh, jeep to the uh, communication. And we heard the pressure, the forces were, you know, in the, in the front line. I remember hearing my friend, uh, Ode Deres, who was the battalion commander, 53, in 188 Brigade. He was crying for help. He was crying for ammunition. Around five o'clock, they finished mostly the, the ammunition. Because you will see in a minute, the, the power, the, the, the the, the power balance, what happened there. But 
we heard that there is an emergency need for every tank to go to the Golan. So we had to prepare tanks. Not, now you have to understand, it's not like today. Today, when you go to the tank, everything is uh, it's covered, everything is ready, ammunition is in, the periscope is in. You just uh, yeah, go in, put the overall in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're out of the camp. Then everything was spread around in the, in the stores. You have to collect the periscope, the ammunition, uh, the, uh, the rounds to open all the packages and to prepare the tanks. It takes for a tank, a crew, four uh, people, something like four, six hours to prepare a tank, correct? You know that, 70 rounds into the tank. You know, with the machine guns, different stores you have to collect and bring it with a car. So it took, it took some time. Most of the troops arrived to, to, to the camp around 11, 11, 12 o'clock, around midnight. So we were really standing like that, under pressure, waiting for the people to come. Okay. The power balance in the Golan on that day, two o'clock, 177 Israeli tanks, which was uh, Brigade, uh, uh, Brigade 7, Brigade 188, against 1,400 tanks. 44 artillery barrels, only against 1,100. This was the situation, two o'clock. I was at home, started to move toward uh, the camp, only at 2.30. Okay, this is not important. Uh, yeah, you know, the main, uh, yeah, the main tanks that were participating was the T-55, which was, you know, like old, like, let's say the Cedrillon, and the T-62 was really a new tank in the area with 115 millimeters, uh, yeah. and it was a very, very good tank. Uh, Sometimes we couldn't, we couldn't really penetrate more than 2,000 uh, meters in front of uh, this tank. Sorry. Okay, a little uh, uh, characteristics on the Golan. A uh, 70 kilometer long, 25 in the widest way, 25 kilometers, two bridges that you have to uh, to cross, and there are main roads that are crossing uh, the Golan. One is the the pipeline. This is the pipeline that comes from the Saudi Arabia, from the Persian Gulf. This pipeline, 1,250 1, kilometers, a pipeline was built in 1920, 1920 by three American companies to move the oil from the Persian Gulf to uh, Mediterranean, to Europe, and, and so on. So the, it's ended in uh, Tripoli. I mean, this line crossing the Golan from south to north, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Golan, uh, uh, Lebanon, then to the port. Uh, this to show you that when you climb to the Golan, you have to use the roads. You cannot climb everywhere. It's not possible. Okay, so you are limited to the roads. Also here, I want to show you that Nafakh, the headquarter of the Golan, during the war, this was the headquarter of the Golan, the, uh, the division, uh, yeah, let's say, commander was sitting there, is the main junction. Once you are here, you're controlling the Golan. Why? Because you are in the junction. Ten minutes to go to the Jordan. You are in the back of uh, Brigade 7. You are coming from the south. When you block here, you cannot supply really, you know, to the poops here. That's what happened uh, at the evening of the first day of the war. This was blocked by the Egyptians. We cannot bring supply to the forces to the south part. Okay? And uh, in, in addition to that, you know, the area was covered with volcanic <coughs> uh, rocks that today when you go to the Golan, you will see the, when you see the place, everything is crushed and, uh, and it's like a sand, but then it was with uh, volcanic uh, rocks. Okay, the plan of the Egyptians and the Syrians was based on a full surprise. This was Yom Kippur. I said before it was their, uh, let's say it was wrong and also right, because it was right, because Yom Kippur, there is no communication and so on. But it was wrong because everybody were at home. 
two weeks ago, or ten days before, Rosh Hashanah, our holidays, all Israel were outside of their homes. They were on the, on the shores, they were on the Sea of Galilee, they were picnicking outside of Israel. I was picnicking also with uh, the intelligence uh, uh, officer of uh, Brigade 401 from Sina in the, in the Golan, in one of the, uh, the wells there, sleeping in a tent. So everybody were out. So you can imagine if there is an alert and you have to collect everybody, they have to go back home to bring their children and so on, and then go back to their units. It just, so they really missed here, and it was, in a, in a, in a way, our luck. Okay, you should understand Hebrew by now. This is division. So division seven, division nine, and division five, and, uh, and the armor division also attacked Israel and commander on the Hermon. And this was uh, a, 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 the, in, the, in the battlefront here. Okay, the plan of the Syrians was to reach their bridges within 24 hours. Why? They knew that the reserve plans, the plan of the, uh, the IDF is that the reserve has to be ready within 24 hours. So this is the plan. So the 24 hour, within 24 hours, the regular army has to hold the borders. But we surprised them because our reserve was ready before 12 hours, 14 hours, 15 hours, a uh, reserve a, 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 a tanks were sent already to the Golan. Okay, we skip that. It's in Hebrew anyway. Okay, the reserve forces arrived to their camp and are grouped according to arrival. What we are saying here, that you are trained, you know, we had training, we had a, a service in the last three years before the war, and you know your gunner, you know who is your commander, you know who is your uh, driver and loader and so on, and you know each other, and you communicate, and, and you are a team. And here, we just uh, took, you are a gunner, you are a driver, uh, you are a commander, let's get to it, because you came first, let's say, uh, gather together, take a tank, prepare it, and let's go. So, we try to send, a, uh, let's say, platoon, platoon uh, units, I mean, three tanks, four tanks together, not, not a, a, a one tank. Okay, a, a, I told you about that. And this is our tank, the tanks. A, a, some of the tanks, most of the tanks lived without coordinating, without both sides, without coordinating the, a, you know, the site with the, with, the, uh, with the gun. So there was no uh, no coordination, and also with not, uh, without uh, full ammunition. We were under, a, you know, urgent demand to leave quickly, so we didn't have the full ammunition. Okay, uh, here we, it's a, uh, you can see the number of tanks that attacked uh, Israel, I mean the Golan, and they, uh, the war started at two o'clock, as you know. And the most important thing I want to show you is how the forces were divided. You can see here that 110 tanks within Brigade 7, four regiments, by the way, and two regiments in the Brigade 188, 188, which was in the south, in the front of 67 tanks were 810 tanks. 67 against 100. Here, Brigade 7, Roni, 110 tanks against 300 tanks. Why I say Roni? Roni was in Brigade 7 during the war. He has an interesting story. You will hear him, you will hear him in the Chippon. Okay, more than that, Brigade 7, Protected with 110 tanks, 17 kilometers against 300 tanks. Brigade 188 protected 35 kilometers, double than that with 67 tanks. Although 
And this is not, a, I mean, there is a lot of criticism why is that and so on, a lot of arguments. And so, but the main attack of the Syrians, the main effort was in the south, not in the north. And that's why they succeeded to penetrate here. It was a more open area than these 17 kilometers to protect quite a closed area, very easy, let's say very easy, easier, let's say, to, to protect, okay? So this is an Hebrew map, so I have to show you. By the way, we are here in Otal, didn't exist then. This is the Shippon Mountain, and Zivan, it's another kibbutz. This is the UN, uh, UN uh, camp that you will see later on also from the, from the viewpoint. Kunetra used to be in 67, the headquarters of the Syrians, okay? Uh, and here is Indiana, and this is Nafah Junction, the headquarter. Okay? So, you understand. The movement you have seen before was the 25 tanks with our brigade commander Oreo left the camp around 7 o'clock in the morning and positioned themselves in the south of Konetra, here the valley, because this was the order he was received by the division commander Raful to protect the valley south of Conetra. But the main war was here, on the, on the pipeline, the main war. Oreo was standing there doing nothing with 25 tanks, sorry, with 25 tanks until noon. In the meantime, sorry, in the meantime, uh, yeah, other forces of the brigade joined, uh, wanted to join a uh, Oryo, our brigade commander. But they were stopped in the junction of Nafah by the division commander Raful, and they were sent inside the, uh, uh, the pipeline to help 188, brigade 188. Okay? And 188 defended, defended the, the pipeline. The Syrian tried to get to Nafah. And the main war was here. Not there, not in the, in the north. And you see the Syrians trying, uh, I mean, attacking Nafa and also trying to uh, cross the main road, Nafa and Zivan. Once you cross this road, once you cross this road, you are threatening the, the backs of uh, Brigade 7. Okay, very short, uh, yeah, very short range. You see one, the, the, the other uh, yeah, battalion commander that came, came up and he was instructed to go inside, inside uh, yeah, the pipeline to help, but after two rounds he was wounded and, uh, and evacuated. Okay, the Syrians are uh, launching again uh, uh, the attack and they, uh, and they are crossing the main road of Enzivad, threatening Brigade 7. What happened then? Oreo received an order to attack Nafah from east to west. And that's what he did with two battalion commanders, Ariel and Schaeffer. On the way, while they're attacking, they stopped the attack. They really uh, uh, prevented from the Syrians to uh, achieve to the back of, to, to arrive to the back of the uh, Brigade 7. And, uh, and they, uh, and they, uh, Arel and Schaeffer were hit by uh, the Syrians. Uh, Arel, is, uh, his tank was uh, damaged. The, the, driver, the driver was uh, killed. He evacuated himself uh, 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 on foot and uh, and Schaeffer was also won, uh, yeah, wounded and, uh, and also evacuated. So the three battalion commanders were hit. Two of them were injured and evacuated. Okay, myself as a second in command, I was with the rest of the forces. And I, I took the last uh, tanks from the, uh, from the, uh, from, uh, the, uh, 
from uh, the battalion, and I moved towards, around noon, moved towards the Golan. I crossed Roshpina, the town Roshpina, towards the, a, uh, to the bridge, to a, 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 a Jacob uh, bridge. On the way, the children in Roshpina waved to me, you know, coming back from, coming back from the schools, but in the background, in the Golan, you could see from the road, you know, all the smoke and the bombings uh, in, uh, on the Golan. And uh, we knew that, uh, yeah, so I, we didn't know what, really what is going on then. What, when when we, I crossed the, uh, the uh, Jacob Bridge, it was ready for explosion. I mean, the engineer scope uh, prepared the bridge to be uh, uh, exploded. Okay, you can imagine the feelings when you go into the Golan, uh, into the chaos, and this is happening. Uh, by the way, when I, I uh, went up to the Golan, I, uh, I climbed up the Golan after the beach. I met the second commander of the division, told me, look, the Syrians are never uh, go fast. I, uh, I drove very fast, and in some, uh, in some place, I decided not to go, you know, with the head to the wall. I took out, I, 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 uh, I uh, went right out of the road on the field and started to, uh, uh, to advance to Nafar camp, you know, in the, in, on the field, you know, taking observation and uh, trying to, uh, to find uh, the Syrians. When I arrived close to Nafar, I saw the Syrians, you know, with their side coming into Nafar. And I, when I reached to the pipeline, I saw a tank, a turnover tank. A turnover tank and uh, there was a, a, a soldier a, a raising a, 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 a yellow flag. Yellow flag in the, in the, in the armor then was a damaged tank. There were a regular army, they were very disciplined. So, you know, Syrians around uh, 500 meters and there was a guy with a flag, uh, raising the flag. So, I asked them what is going on and uh, he told me that uh, the brigade commander Ben Shoam uh, is killed and is a uh, chief, uh, let's say, uh, uh, officer, uh, operation officer, Benny Katzin, was killed inside the tank. By the way, both of them, uh, uh, Ben Shoam was my brigade commander when we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, founded a new, a new battalion in China, in Brigade 7, uh, which was a battalion 53. Ben Shoam was the, the battalion commander. I was a, a company commander, Ode Deres, also my colleague, was also company commander. Benny Katzin was the, the operation uh, officer. And he was in my uh, wedding, by the way, uh, Ben Shoam. So you can understand what kind of shock I was, and I had to overcome this and continue. So this was his uh, memorial, uh, by the way. And uh, while I'm there, I've seen a, a, a 14 tanks, a company, 14 tanks, you know, driving like a hell from south towards me on the, uh, on the, on the pipeline. I stopped them, asked them, look what is going on. And I understand they were, uh, let's say, in panic. And they said, issue our company, our company uh, a, a commander was killed. I didn't know what to do. I told them, look, you are joining me. They were, they were from another brigade, from Brigade 179, not from my brigade. But I know some of the people uh, there because I was also a, 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 in the a commander course uh, instructor, in the, in the tank commander course uh, instructor, so I knew uh, most of the officers there. So they joined me. And on that night, we created a new uh, battalion. So I've succeeded to collect around me 24 tanks, which was then maybe 50% of the brigade, because at that night we left with something like 50 tanks. Because all the tanks that came, you know, to join the uh, the uh, uh, Orio, the brigade commander, they were sent inside, and you will you will hear the stories here from my colleagues later on how. Uh, yeah, the face, the sea, and the first time. You have to understand that you were a civilian 24 hours before. 
you're not in, uh, in, you know, in action, so you're civilian. Some of the soldiers, uh, the, the reservists, they came with their, white, uh, with their white shirts into the war, without uniform even, uh, you know, straight from the uh, synagogue. And that's how they came into the tank and how the, they, uh, the, that's how they fired. And on that night, just to explain you, this is what after the first day that they fight for Nafak, because in the afternoon we pushed out the Syrians out of Nafak and they withdrew themselves south to Sindiana and the uh, Ramtania. To explain you the situation, it was a chaos. You can understand the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the trauma, uh, let's say, and, uh, and the effect of, uh, you know, going into the battle and within minutes, your tank is exploded. Uh, you see your friends uh, burned. You see your friends cleared. You see your tanks exploded and all the, uh, the crews are, uh, 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 are gone. And uh, this is not a nice, uh, a nice view. And a nice, so, so you could see the body language of the people going like that. So we had to gather them together. I had to gather the people. I looked at their eyes and said, you are now a company commander. You are a company commander. I knew some of the people. And I nominated, and, and this ritual was every day. Every day, because we lost people and we had to organize again. And uh, uh, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't know. So I said, look, yeah. So I nominated three company commanders and uh, platoon commanders and so on. I gave them instruction. And the first mission of my battalion was to protect the road to the uh, bridge. You have to understand, the Syrians in Nafakh, 10 minutes drive from the bridge, it means a, 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 a a real, a real a danger to the, the existence of Israel. Because behind us, behind our, uh, our forces, there was nothing. Only the bridge were ready for explosion, and that's all. And the, uh, the Egyptians came uh, ready with uh, hydraulic mobile uh, bridges, you know, folded bridges that they could put on the Jordan, 18 meters, 20 meters, 1 meters, and cross the Jordan. So that night, we got organized uh, again in new uh, three uh, battalion commanders. And this is the withdrawal of the, uh, uh, of the Syrians uh, back. Okay. And we took our position. Here I am. And also Amnon Ramon was nominated a uh, commander, by the way, this is our first aid. You know, when you climb to the Golan after the uh, Mnotikov Bridge, there is a, a new hotel built here. And this is our first aid, uh, our, our battalion, first aid uh, uh, station. <coughs> Not nice uh, uh, picture. Okay, on the 8th in the morning, without sleeping, of course, you were under alert sitting in the tank. By the way, for days, we were, for days, for two weeks, we didn't leave the tank. We didn't sleep outside. We were inside. I mean, sitting in your seat, the commander, everybody was in his seat. Uh, I mean, the gunner, the, 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 even the, the driver didn't open his uh, edges. They were in. Everything was done inside the tank. Okay, so uh, the, new, the new commanders, Amnon Rimbaud was second in command. He was nominated uh, battalion commander myself. I nominated myself, by the way. Arel came back, and also, so both of them, they have something like 12 tanks. I had 24 tanks, both of the forces. So we had something like 48 tanks all together on that morning, Monday morning. And Monday morning, before the sunshine, we took positions just in front of Nafakh here, before of Nafakh here. Arel was here near the, the, the uh, Chipon mountain. Rimon was on my uh, right here near the, uh, there is a quarry there called Kfarger Quarry. And when we climbed up to our position, we found out that the Syrians are already, are already in the middle of attack. We, didn't, we, we uh, yeah, spot them 
uh, in the range of 400 meters, and they were driving towards us. Close hatches, shooting, driving towards us. And we were sitting in our position, and we started to shoot, you know, like, uh, you know, a, a very, very quick, short range, and short range every, every, uh, every round is really a hit. Uh, I think I, my gunner destroyed that morning something like 25, 30 tanks, destroyed, really. But they continue to come. The, the Syrians, the commander tanks were their heads under the edges. We, I mean the Israelis, our, our uh, head is outside of the edge. We put the edge behind us to protect, but we can look 360 degrees. We have a better, better view. The Egyptians were limited. They didn't see really the other tanks that were, they were damaged and destroyed and they uh, got burned. And they still continued. And sometimes they even passed our, our line. So you have to, to take your gun, you know, to 90, 90 degrees and shoot the tanks that come uh, towards you. And you have to stand. Amnon Rimon was killed. After a while, I think something at around 10 o'clock in the morning, he was killed, and the Syrians tried to bypass us towards to Nafah again. They wanted to take Nafah again. But my uh, company commander, Haggai Koel, uh, uh, spot them, turn his uh, company to my order, and uh, confronted the, the troops that are trying to bypass us towards Nafah and stop this, uh, this attack. By noon, by afternoon, the Syrians started to withdraw themselves. By the way, during that time and during that morning, the artillery was on us, you know, covering every meter. The artillery, the Syrian artillery. We didn't have artillery at all. The, all the artillery, by the way, for the people here from Brigade 7, was to support Brigade 7. We didn't have artillery. We didn't have uh, Air Force. We were only tanks, not even infantry, only tanks. So in the afternoon, after the withdrawal of the Syrians, we launched an, an, a counterattack. So it was after a more than half day of shooting and shooting and shooting, we were really empty of ammunition. And also with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fuel. We launched the attack with a, uh, two brigades, RL and me, uh, sorry, two battalions. And while driving, crossing the area, going down, going up to Antania, I started to hear that the uh, uh, commanders are reporting that they've finished their ammunition, they are short of uh, fuel, so they are returning back. And on that day, in the afternoon, I found myself alone in uh, Ramtania. This is Amnon Ramon. We launched an attack. And you see myself arriving alone to Ramtania. There was two hills. Uh, looking over Khushnia camp, there was a, a camp. The Syrians were, a lot of the Syrians there. And I started to shoot at them, you know, to shoot at them very quickly. And in a short time, I destroyed uh, something, eight, ten tanks. And all of this army, by, by the way, when I climbed the Ramtania, the, uh, the, 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 the tanks were, you know, withdrawing from, uh, from the place. And they, all of them, shot at me. I heard some of the rounds over my head, around my uh, sides, and uh, one uh, got the target hit between the, uh, the turret and the under, under carriage. Uh, and they, uh, and, and my, my uh, loader was wounded heavily, and his uh, back fell down. We had to evacuate, evacuate him out. It was very heavy. We carried him on our backs uh, along the uh, village there, old village, 
and the Syrians after with artillery. And I was lucky because 500 meters from me, I saw a hell starting to go back. And I waved to him. He saw us and he came back and took us back to our, to our brigade. So that's how we evacuated ourselves. And uh, we finished this. This and, uh, is a counterattack. That's a, 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 the, on, this, on this afternoon. So by the way, this is my uh, tank. Uh, these people are my reconnaissance people. How I have this picture? We didn't have cameras then, we didn't have telephone and so on. Uh, two weeks after we, uh, we penetrate Syria, I asked my reconnaissance, when you are bringing the supply, go to this uh, place. You know what I'm telling you? Yeah, maybe you can find my sunglasses. I can't say. <laughs> I needed my sunglasses, <laughs> but uh, they went there. They didn't find my sunglasses, but they bought me this uh, picture. And so this is the picture. That's how I have the, uh, the picture of my, of my tank. OK, on the night, the same night, we went back, and we again, the same ritual, we started to organize the forces to see who is left after the, day, uh, the Second Day War. Uh, and we organized again the battalions. And on that night, we prepared an ambush. I mean, we took position at night. Our reconnaissance uh, uh, unit uh, uh, led us to the positions. I took position here in Sindiana. Arel took a position, but we were left to two battalion commanders. Okay, Arel took a position uh, on my left here near the uh, Chipon. And we were waiting at night for the Syrians to come. By the way, we were lucky that the Syrians didn't attack us during the night because we didn't have any uh, uh, night sights. The Syrians had night sights. Uh, therefore, the drivers, therefore, the uh, commanders, we didn't have anything. Uh, we had to use, you say, illumination, you know, projectors, or uh, maybe, uh, you know, flames and so on. But, uh, 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 we were lucky, probably they were uh, uh, tired because they fought the first night. The first night that they penetrated into us, they fought all night. So they were probably, I guess, tired. So we took position here, waiting for uh, the Syrians to come. And in the morning of the third day, we saw the Egyptians, you know, going down from, from Romtania towards Envarda, this place. We stopped them, we didn't let it from the, we, This day, we were sitting very good in our positions. We didn't leave the Syrians to come closer than 2,000 meters. So the, so the range of uh, uh, damaging the Syrians was 2,000, 2,500 uh, meters on that day. Envarda sitting very well on our position, shooting them, and we destroyed a lot of tanks. We were under artillery all the time, and also Sager missiles from the back. There was a commando sitting here in this area, in this area, and all the time they were shooting at us Sagers. Also, they also we had damaged some of our tanks. And on the Tuesday afternoon, by the way, in the morning, also some helicopters. Commander helicopter Syrians landed behind our forces. They were destroyed by our reconnaissance unit. Some, uh, some uh, hours and others, uh, they didn't really uh, fulfill their mission. In the, after uh, the afternoon, we launched another uh, counterattack to uh, Ramtania. And I was left then. I was left alone because when we started the attack, Arel was wounded again. And I arrived here to Envarda. Envarda is the lowest place. I was sitting in the lowest place waiting for other forces, according to the plan, that were supposed to join us, to support us on that attack. They didn't come. And the dark was coming. We asked, uh, or we all asked me, gave an order to make an assault to attack without any, any support. I look around me, and this is something that I think I will, I will remember all my life. You know, 
when you are sitting, you have the, the decisions, you know, a, a shooting over your heads, you are down, they have the, a, 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 I would say, the one, a, advantage, sorry, the advantage, the advantage of sitting uh, up, and, uh, and the message, you could, you could uh, count the strings of the, uh, you know, the message, the set of the, the uh, a, uh, Sager, Sager message. And then I have, I have looked around me, and I saw the body language of my commanders. They were really afraid. They had a cause, I mean, reasonably. And I had to take an assault and give them an order to make an assault. And I know that we have to, I knew that we have to do it together. But I didn't know that I was not sure that I will uh, succeed to move all of them together. So what I did, I gave an order. And in the last moment, in the last uh, thinking, I gave an order in the outside communication. Driver advance. And then all the drivers heard me. And when I said driver advance, I started to move. Everybody joined me. And when we started to move, we had to cross, you know, the area on the rocks and so on towards the Syrians. They were sitting higher than us. And we had to destroy the Syrians with the, within the range of 50 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, zero. We crossed and they were standing. We saw the explosion of their tanks. We, did, we have only two casualties, by the way, wounded officer. I'll tell you later on about that. And I found myself during that, you know, the smokes and the explosions that I, I am passing a, a live tank, Syrian tank. And I tried to move my uh, gun towards them, but it was jump, you know, in the back. You know, it's jumping. So I asked my uh, other officers to, uh, to kill this tank, and it was killed. By that night, really, it was... Uh, the whole the Ramtania was illuminated uh, by the Syrians' uh, uh, tanks, which were on uh, fire and explosions. And this is really was the, uh, the, uh, the attack that make the, uh, the Syrians to understand that they could not make because they've tried three times, four times to take an effort, they didn't succeed. And by the night of uh, Tuesday, most of the Syrians who left the Golan. And the next morning, we had to take care of this uh, commando commando forces in the Kalaot here. So these are uh, my uh, colleagues, Ben David, uh, uh, Sassi, Wagman, and the Barbanel that took part in this attack. And there is a story, one of uh, Barbanel, a uh, company, company commander. Uh, he was uh, eaten by a uh, Sager. He was flown out without, uh, without gun, without any protection. He was uh, confronted a uh, Syrian, a Syrian uh, a officer. He was shooting at him. He was hit in his leg. He tried to find himself under the tank to, to hide himself. And he was hiding, the Syrian was hiding after behind one of our tanks. And our commander that saw the Syrians, he saw his shadow. When he was moving, the shadow was moving also. He was behind our tank. And he ordered some of the tanks behind to shoot the Syrians, and he was killed. By 10 o'clock on that morning, there was no Syrians on the Golan, on the Golanite. This is the first time we are gathering together with our brigade commander, Orio. This is Aurel, who was wounded the day before and left the uh, hospital, came back the day after. He is myself. Uh, he is Ben David. Kathy was a, uh, my operation a, uh, officer. Uh, and uh, Berko was the operation officer of the, uh, of the brigade. So we were sitting together and looking at the maps and planning the attack towards, uh, 
towards Syria. I suggest, I, since it was really too long, have 10 minutes a, a, a break, have a coffee. With We, I mean, we reached the end of the, let's say, the defending and holding uh, battle. And now we are going to the, you know, the counterattack penetration into uh, Syria. But before I go into that, do you have any questions? Yes, please. It's, it's just, just a minute. Before you start, you have to talk, you know, slowly. Yeah. Proper English, then I will stand quickly. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> it's um, counterfactual history slightly, but I wanted to ask you whether you thought if you were stationed on the Golan during the actual initial attack, would you have had more success or less? Do you think you would have lost more? We lost less, yeah. of course. If we were stationed in the Golan, I mean, the two brigades fully equipped with the other two brigades. Uh, more or less, say, uh, uh, let's say, uh, close to 400 tanks. We would uh, uh, not let the uh, Syrians to uh, even take one meter. But you have to, you have to understand here what happened when the uh, commander of a uh, brigade 188 that really was defending. They do a great job in defending and holding the Syrians in the south. He was responsible in the south. By the way. One of his battalion was in the north with uh, Brigade 7. And Brigade 7 gave one of their brigade to uh, a, a brig uh, so battalion to uh, 188. It's, you know, for you to understand the numbers and so, maybe it's difficult. But he was fighting only with one battalion of his, I mean, uh, 188 uh, Brigade Commander, Ben Shuang. And they did a great job in defending whatever they could, the 67 tanks against 800. You can understand that. And once they penetrate into Israel, it was difficult to bring ammunition to the front, uh, to the front uh, fighters, I mean, the tanks, the tanks in the front. And uh, when, we, when we arrived, uh, symbolically, you could say, when we arrived to Nafakh, in the noon of uh, uh, Sunday, 2.30 in the afternoon, we took control of the central part of Nafakh, and since then there was no any achievement. I mean, there was their forces, and only we were left 50% of our forces. No achievement of the Syrians. They tried again and again, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, to take Nafakh without success. You have to understand that. So it was really a great achievement because we, I mean, the reserve, the last forces really, because behind us there was nothing as you could understand. And we pushed the sea in the back. This was the holding. Something that uh, one of your colleagues that asked me for, I didn't mention to you, that on Tuesday, the day we were sitting good, you know, I was sitting in Sea Indiana after the ambush and so on, I placed five tanks. Three of my tanks were damaged by the artillery, and I couldn't uh, use it. And the last tank I moved on was a short call. I mean, the new, uh, the new tank with the power terrain and uh, failed. And as I, I illustrated before, like moving from Deshvo to a Mercedes, I felt, you know, and, and, and the crew was from other brigade, from Brigade 179. And uh, I didn't know the people inside the tank. I gave them order. You know, when I, uh, when I knew their names, only after we penetrated into, into Syria. They were inside. I was commanding commanding them, and they were performing perfectly. They were very professional. They were really very good. They destroyed a lot of tanks uh, during Tuesday and uh, other days. So I mean, me as a battalion commander, I was using my gunner destroying tank. Not only sitting in the back, I was always in the front of the line, front of the troops. So all the company, <coughs> Uh, commanders were on my left, on my right, but I was in the front line as a commander. And uh, I mean, we will talk about uh, leadership later on when we go to the, uh, to the Chipotle Mountain. We leave it for later. Let's go now. I, I answered your question, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think so. 
I hope so. Okay, any other question, please? Please. Oh, I did have one, I'm sorry. Um, in the years before the war... Sorry? In the years before the war... In the year before the war, yes. In the years before the war, how often did you walk this ground? How often did you rehearse your breakout? Okay. And did you rehearse your resupply? Okay, we were, I mean, we were, uh, when we moved, when we started our reserve let's say duty in 1970, we were supposed to go to the Suez Canal. The first, the first running was Suez Canal. We didn't really train on the Golan with tanks. We didn't train. But we were trained every year. You know, I mean, the, the, uh, the crews, the companies, and the brigade, we trained every year. Something like four weeks, uh, six weeks. So we were, we were really a, a, in a, a after good training. But something else you have to know, that some of our troops, our, some of our uh, 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 soldiers, I mean crew, uh, tank members, they came to us after being two and a half years in the infantry. They did a, 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 a training on the tank for six months and then went on the reserve. So they were not there. Were, Let's say I, I don't want to get into it. It's very complicated. Some religi religious, religious uh, 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 soldiers, uh, after doing infantry two and a half years, six months of training, then went to the reserve. So they were not, uh, uh, let's say, as trained as the other uh, crew members, tank members that were three years on the tanks, you know, before they go into uh, into the reserve. Okay. Anyway, okay. So I told you this is the first uh, gathering here. And this is another picture. This is uh, Orio, our brigade commander. This is me and the second of command, uh, Levy Mann, and Arel, the battalion uh, commander. Uh, this picture was taken by a journalist. By the way, we didn't have many pictures during this, uh, from this war. All we got from journalists. Okay, the, the plan was to attack uh, yeah, Syria with three divisions. A tan division in the north, Lanner division in the middle, and uh, a reserve division, Pellet, in the south. When you say division, usually it should be a minimum 200, 220 tanks, two, two brigades, minimum. But on that time, on Thursday, when we started the counterattack, we were only half of it. I mean, 100 tanks, the division. So we were at the brigade 50, 60 tanks. The other brigade also 60. We were with the Lanner, with Lanner, Lanner Brigade. This is our brigade, 179 brigade, the reserve brigades. And by the way, I mean, the, the main forces of the Syrians were protecting the main road to Damascus. And the main road of Damascus is here from, uh, from uh, sorry, uh, I don't see, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, I'll show you in a minute in another, in another skip, okay? Okay, I can show you here, first of all, this was the, the place where we, at, we started the counterattack. This is the main road to Khan Arnabe, Khan Arnabe to Damascus, 60 kilometers. 60 kilometers from this place. And this is the new Conetra. New Conetra is built after, after the uh, 73 war, was built here, and didn't exist then, it was Khan Arnabe. It was a, a protected uh, position. The main army were protecting this main road. In the north, with, seven, with Brigade 7, and the Golani and 188 Brigade that attacked from north, there was no really fight. They penetrated, they didn't have many forces there. The only fight was in a, a, a how you call it? Tel Shams. Huh? Tel Shams. No, no, no. Tel Shams is the Basof. I didn't remember at the beginning. The place where the Rocket was located, Roni. Mazad Bechan. Mazad Bechan. Only there they had a fight, but even not even not a, uh, Brigade 7 was under forces that joined Brigade 7, Amos uh, forces, but never mind. Uh, just to show you here, uh, uh, Khan Arnabe, Shar Mountain, 
מאוטס ג'אנקשן, קורין מאונטן, אנטר מאונטן, נאסג' You will limit it, you will see uh, what happened there. The Brigade 179 started the attack. They were in front of us, going on the main road to Khan Arnabe, one line, uh, one convoy on the left on the, and the side, on uh, the left on the, and the right of the road. It was mine, minefield. You couldn't leave the road. You have to drive on the road. You know, one gun on the right, one gun on the left, and you have to go that and shoot, trying to find a wide range, you know, to shoot during uh, driving. You have to cross here something like five kilometers. And what happened with uh, 179? They uh, reached Khan Arnabe, but they didn't succeed to penetrate Khan Arnabe. Then we had to go in. We went in in four forces. Ben David, Ariel, myself, and Sassi. And the year began. So what happened on the way? When they went back, this convoy, uh, with casualties, with a, a, a wounded people on the turret, on the, on the back of the tanks, they were coming back, we had to go. You have to know that all the road was covered with uh, <coughs> artillery, anti-tanks, and tanks. One road, you have to go and penetrate this uh, position. Position, one meter of concrete, uh, everything is covered, tanks and, and anti-tank uh, missiles. Okay, what happened here? We went in the four forces. Uh, ben David took right, uh, uh, Ariel took left. He was wounded when he took left by our forces from the north. Ben David was killed. Uh, there is a story behind it about Ben David, I will tell you in a minute. And we crossed Khan Arnabe on the way on the road, the, half, the, uh, the commander of our brigade, Oreo, was commanding from half track. You know what is half track? The American, all from the Second World War, half track, wheels in the front, uh, rubber trunks in the back. Uh, this is half track. So he was, he was it. He was it. His uh, communication officer was uh, killed. He was lying on the, on the side of the road. I saw him. I watched him while driving very fast. I saw him. I, uh, I stopped, I took him on my tank, and we continued the, uh, the assault. So all this road was covered, and we crossed Khan Arnabe. We crossed Khan Arnabe and took positions here near Tel Sha'ar. The position was not, I mean, the Khan Arnabe was not clear. We crossed it, but they were not clear. There were still Syrians inside the position. Only at night, we had to send some, uh, some uh, brigade, uh, uh, a parachute brigade to clear, to clear the, uh, the position from, uh, from the Syrians to open the road for the supplies. Okay, we took, uh, uh, we took our position near the Tel Shah. Ben David, by the way, a story, he was with us in the chieftain, uh, chieftain uh, uh, group. Uh, he was in the reconnaissance and then uh, became a tank, tank commander, officer, and company commander. And uh, he was very brave, very brave guy, a friend of mine. He was in my uh, a honeymoon uh, with his wife. We were uh, a, uh, together in a lot, uh, spending a week together. And we knew each other for a long time. And here, he took right and was killed. A day, two days before, on Tuesday, he was sent with, two, with three tanks to save the reconnaissance of Brigade 7. And it was here in the north, here in the north, the reconnaissance of, uh, a company reconnaissance of uh, Brigade 7 was trapped by the Syrian commander, and he was sent one hour drive, you know, with tank, to save them because the seventh brigade couldn't really take one tank from their front line in order to help their own reconnaissance. So he came and really saved them. There were a lot of uh, wounded people. They were with armored, uh, uh, like the, the American armored uh, 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 infantry trucks, the M113. Uh, a lot of them were killed and wounded, and he saved, he saved them and went, uh, went back to our troops. 
Only years later, they were looking who really came to save them. And there is a story behind it. They came to my office and uh, asked who was the guy. And so, look, he was killed and so on. But they invited his wife for the ceremony in the Golan. They have also a memorial a, a place a, near uh, Masade. OK, you can see some of the, uh, the views, you know, the way the road, we call it America Road, the main road to Damascus. This is, again, uh, pictures taken by a journalist. Some of our tanks, this is uh, Nathan Shaishan, uh, one of our platoon commander's tank. He survived this uh, one, but he went, I mean, he, uh, he, uh, he died from a disease some, some years ago. Okay, in the morning of Friday morning, we received new forces. And who were the new forces? Uh, uh, officers and crews, returners, we call it returners from abroad. I think like only Iraq in Israel, only in Israel you can find, you know, officers and, uh, uh, and the soldiers. That when, when, there, when Israel is under danger, they are leaving everything if they are students abroad, if they are traveling abroad, or they are living abroad, they make their living in the abroad, they're living everything, they're living their place, and they come back to Israel. They're queuing, you know, in the airports to come back to join the war. And this is what happened here. We built uh, uh, some battalions, I can't remember, maybe three or four battalions from returners from, from abroad that came back, went on tanks, and there were new trips. They were led by Golan, Nati Golan. Nati Golan was a... Uh, the hero of Israel in the Six Day War, and he, he, was, uh, he got these new troops, these 20 tanks. He joined our brigade in the morning of Friday. Now, during the night, we didn't receive our ammunition because the road was closed. The Syrians attacked our convoys on the way, on the main uh, road. Uh, yeah, they, they eat some of our uh, yeah, lorries. Uh, one of the second, uh, second com uh, say deputy, a, uh, a battalion commander, was wounded then, who was leading this, uh, this convoy. They didn't arrive, and we decided to continue the attack without waiting the ammunition and the fuel. And when we received these uh, new forces, Orior gave them an order to lead, to lead the, uh, the division, the, the, uh, the brigade. And during that morning, also, we received some attack from the Syrians throwing on us bombs, 250 kilos bombs, MiG-21s. Uh, you know, where, where a bomb uh, of 250 kilos, you know, a, a landing 50 meters from you, the tank, tank is jumping. So they didn't hit us, but we decided not to stay in the one position to move. So Nati Golan, with his new forces, lead the, uh, the brigade. And when he went towards Corinne Mountain here, very important spot, he was, he was hit by uh, the Syrians. And it seems that it was, I was behind him. And it seems that he was uh, entering an ambush. When I came near him, bef uh, after him, and I saw his tanks and, uh, and armor tanks, you know, exploding, and the troops are uh, spreading around, I mean, the, the, the crew members spreading around, and he was wounded. So all the his brigade, uh, brigade uh, uh, battalion was really scattered uh, around. I didn't see the Syrians. Then all he all saw that this is the situation, and he gave an order to lead, to lead the brigade. And I looked around with my binocular, and I didn't see the Syrians. You know, they, uh, two days before, every day I could spot the Syrians, you know, very, very easily. You could see when they take a position and so, when they run away, when they, they open the fire, I could see them. But when I looked around, I saw, uh, you know, tanks are burning, but I couldn't see one 
sea and tank. I didn't know, and it was a flat area. And there was only one mountain there, Corinne Mountain. It formed something like uh, three, four kilometers in front of me. And I decided then I, I need to move. I decided to take, an, to take another tank, not to take risk of the others. And I uh, climbed to this mountain, the Corinne Mountain, and see what is going on, because I didn't see anything. So I crossed the forces, driving very fast with another company, uh, Barak Sela from Kibbutz Yagur. We crossed the troops of uh, Nati Gulan. We drove very quickly and zigzag, you know, to reach, and they shoot at us, uh, to reach the mountain. When we started to climb the mountain, we saw the Syrians, you know, withdrawing themselves, going back. We stood on the, on the top of the mountain. The Syrians, you could see in front of you, the valley, it was a valley, uh, yeah, with a lot of ditches. I mean, hundreds of ditches. And in every ditch was a tank or an armored, armored vehicle. And we started to shoot at them. Two tanks sitting <coughs> on the mountain, Korean mountain. And we started to eat uh, the tanks. It was the range 800 meters, 1,000 meters. Very easy. And then my uh, guy, and then we started to see the Syrians like by order, moving out from the ditches, turning and running away towards Damascus. And you could see the, you know, the, uh, the dust of hundreds of vehicles, you know, running away outside of their ditches. And then my uh, company commander reported to me, I have only nine rounds left. Remember, we didn't uh, refill our uh, berries before. And I told him, stay with three rounds, shoot the rest, and wait. So I did myself. I asked all your uh, brigade commander, send a, uh, please ask for the Air Force now. This is the time, you know, to destroy the, uh, the Syrian army, because the old Syrian army, you could see convoys of, of uh, tanks and the armored uh, vehicles running to Damascus. The Air Force didn't come, but we had to put, to fill uh, the ammunition. We filled the ammunition here in, uh, in the place called a, a, a Nasej here. Okay, in Nasej, we got, we got together and the convoy of ammunition arrived, it was noon and we had to open the, the packages, you know, the, uh, the boxes and uh, refill our tank. And while we were refilling the, our ammunition, we got a message, the Iraqis are coming towards you. And the Iraqis came from this side, from Antar. Remember, we were here, they came from here. Here, the Iraqis forces, the first force of the, the, uh, the Iraqis sent a division to help, to help the Syrians. And we got that message with the munitions still on the turret and, and under, uh, you know, carriage and so on the back. We drove and crossed the village, just went over the, uh, the buildings, you know, uh, small buildings, we crossed them. And when we went out of the village, we saw two convoys of uh, Iraqis. They didn't know where it comes from. Within 15 minutes, 20 minutes, we destroyed something like 30, 40 uh, uh, tanks without any damage to our forces. They returned and ran away back to Damascus. At night, we were around uh, Mats uh, Junction, the way to, again, by the way, here, when you say Tel Shar, uh, we Tel Shar, this is the main road, the main road to Damascus. Okay, we stayed here, it's here, and there. Uh, The next day, let's say the next three days, we had to fight against the Syrians. We took a, a, the, the Baal and Maschara mountains here, and we confronted the Jordanians coming from south. Also, the Jordanians joined the war. They wanted to help the Syrians. And I'll tell you the story. The Jordanians came with 80 tanks. 80 tanks. And they... Uh, they, uh, they went back to Jordan with 50 tanks. They left 30 tanks and they went back. 30 years after, 
I was invited to Nafakh to the headquarters to meet the uh, brigade commander. The, the Jordanian brigade commander, he was 75 years old, walking with his uh, stick. Uh, probably he was 45 when he was the commander, commander then. And we were really exchanging uh, uh, the experience of the war. And he, was told, uh, he told us what, what happened, that he had 80 tanks, left 30 tanks and so on. But we saw them, you know, keeping away. They didn't want really to fight. They, they kept, let's say, a range of three and a half, four kilometers with uh, flags on their antenna, so you could spot them very, uh, very easily. So you saw that they didn't uh, really wanted to fight. And the story behind it, that uh, I asked the, 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 uh, the brigade commander, why did you come to help the Syrians? Three years before, the Syrians wanted to invade into Jordan, and we saved you, because we threatened the Syrians, if you go into Jordan, we will uh, go in also, because the, the Syrians wanted to go to Jordan because uh, 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 the Palestinians, the, uh, King Hussein killed 3,500 3, Palestinians in one week because they, uh, they had the air, uh, riots and wanted to take the, uh, uh, the kingdom, you know, to, to take control of Jordan. So he killed 3,500. The, the Syrians tried to camp and we really saved, saved Hussein then in 90s, which was called the Black September. The Palestinians called it the Black September. And uh, from that time, from September 1970, the, all the Palestinians moved to Lebanon. Then the civilian war in Lebanon, so on, uh, another story. Uh, so this is, and I asked him, why did you come? And he said, we wanted to show solidarity, Arab, Arabic solidarity. So this is, where, and this is really was because I know from behind our, uh, let's say, chief of staff and uh, the, the commanders, they were afraid because we didn't have forces in the, in the you know, protecting against Jordan near Jerusalem in, in, the, in the center of Israel. And then the Jordanians said that they are not joining the war, they are only going to help the Syrians, but to show themselves and not really. Uh, so we, we got the message. I mean, then I know now because I'm reading the books and what happened, you know, behind the scenes before. So they didn't really want to fight. But this was a nice experience to meet your, your enemy uh, yeah, 30 years after. Okay, in the last, in the next, uh, 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 the ceasefire uh, your borders was fixed around the Antar mountain here. I was sitting here with my uh, battalion and uh, uh, I was really, uh, I was uh, taking the, when we had a ceasefire, you see 25 kilometers we went, and this was the border. I marked the border with the UN. I went with my jeep, behind me was the UN. I put the flag, the, the battalion were protecting, you know, sitting in their position, uh, because it was something like one, one and a half kilometers in front. And we, we went on the, and the border, we put the flags and we sang the maps, what is the area, the penetration area, and this is the border. So I really marked the, the eastern side of this border, I marked myself with, uh, with the flags. Okay, uh, we uh, as a reserve, we served seven months, a reserve, seven months in the army. We went through the winter, hard winter, the results of the war. In the Golan, we had 780 casualties, 70 prisoners, 105 planes in all the army were damaged. Uh, IDF lost 500 tanks out of 2,200. By the way, the number of tanks that each of the armies had then, it was 2,200 tanks, the, the Syrians, and 2,200 uh, tanks, the Egyptians. This was, I mean, the Golan and the Egypt was the last, and uh, the last, uh, really, the, the greatest ba the tank battle in the world after Kirks in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, Ru in Russia in the Second World War. And since then, there was no really a tank battle like we had this. This was a really entirely uh, tank battle, uh, purely a tank battle. The Syrians lost uh, 3,000, uh, 360 prisoners, 
1,100 tanks were destroyed and abandoned. And we, we were within the range of the, uh, the, the artillery to Damascus. Uh, most of the Navy was destroyed. Syrian Air Force completely paralyzed, uh, and so on and so on. 40 years of quiet. This is our memorial in the Golan, near the Shippon Mountain. Every year we gather together here with all the uh, veterans and, uh, and the today a uh, brigade every year to a, uh, a ceremony to, uh, for the memory. And here this is, we will, we will uh, uh, go there uh, later on. Uh, this is a viewpoint we built to overlook the battlefield. You will be sitting here uh, giving a, uh, you know, heritage uh, uh, all the time here. Any questions, gentlemen? Welcome to, welcome to the viewpoint of Brigade 679 and uh, in front of you is the battlefield of uh, Brigade 679 and uh, you are uh, look, looking really in the, to the south of the Golan on your left is east I just uh, uh, wanted to use uh, the area first uh, on the left the, the, the chain of mountain you see is called Hazeka. And uh, behind this mountain is the border with Syria, just on the slopes. And we have uh, one position there, you can see some mountain, and uh, the position there, which was during the war and stayed all the way there. They didn't withdraw, they stayed there. Although the Syria pushed them, the position stayed. You are sitting on the Shippur mountain, two mountains, the eastern one and the western one, and uh, we used to have here positions only after the war, not before the war. You see four mountains, the one, uh, the round one is the Tel Forest, Tel Forest there, the forest mountain is sitting on the junction really, from west to east and from south to north. From there, the Syrians really penetrated. And you see how wide is the area. It's, you know, from the road, we just, you cross the road to climb up. This is the road, the border between Brigade 7 and Brigade 6, 7, uh, 188. And now this was our battlefield after Brigade 188 has done their job. We went in and we were responsible on all this area. Uh, yes, Indiana is uh, when you see the bunch of trees above above the uh, small uh, water. This is Indiana. Montana, a very important and a uh, essential essential uh, a mountain that controls really the south of the old south of the Golan. Is where you see the trees. And you see one bear mountain on the right. So it's called the Rampaniyat, I mean two mountains. The, the, the village is where the, it's something like three and a half thousand meters from here. It's a, uh, it's the, you see the, the forest, the village is in the forest, and the bear mountain on the right. There is another one that you see in front of us. This is the Chuchader. And the Juhader is really the border, the Syrian border. And from Juhader to Nafah, there is the pipeline that's going just in front of us. From there, crossing to Nafah, crossing, crossing the river. I uh, would like to, uh, I would like to pass the, uh, the flag to Rony Lefebvre, who was a platoon commander in one of the classic ambushes 
made a uh, Saturday night when a uh, complete uh, uh, brigade started to uh, try to come from south to north towards Brigade 7. And I was in the company that stopped us, uh, 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 that uh, brigade. So, what is this? Well, my name is Ron. Uh, in 73, I was 20 years old. Three months after Officers Academy, I received my command on a, a platoon in the 7th Brigade. We were moved from the Sinai Desert two weeks before the war started to the Golan Heights. Is it okay? You are okay? And I was stationed in a company that the radio code was Tiger. This was the, uh, the name in the radio. Two o'clock, the war started, and the first order I, I received from my uh, company commander was to take my platoon around two kilometers north from where we are right now. And the order I received is to block a road uh, from the uh, penetration of a brigade. I'm with three tanks. Now, the, since I was very young, the company commander uh, asked his deputy to join me, so we were four tanks. I took position, I found the uh, place, the position that he wanted me to be in. I was standing there and, read, and heard on the radio that my friends, Aidan and the others, are already in battle. They started to shoot and in my area nothing happened. Now think about an order for a, a platoon to block a brigade. This was the first order that I received, okay? Around 9 o'clock I heard on the radio one of uh, the stations that was shouting for help. It turned to be that this is the position that Chaim was talking about. It's, it's the higher point on the hill. They were shouting because a, a commando, Syrian commando battalion attacked them and there were uh, Syrians inside the area of this station. And from one of the commands, I don't know where, who answered them, a very calm voice told them that they don't have anyone to send to help and they need to hold position. I looked at the map and I saw that it's two kilometers from the area I was standing. So I decided to change the orders I received. I took my platoon and we moved to this position. You know, we are tanks. And you, if you are moving in an open uh, area, you need to move fast with a lot of fire. So we fired all over. We moved very fast. We have four tanks. I told my sergeant to take position. And with another tank, we entered the, uh, the place. I assume that the Syrians heard the tanks. They didn't know how many tanks are coming. Remember, it's night, it's dark, and this has probably stopped the attack. At that time, my company commander was, that was stationed northern, around kilometers, one kilometer northern than the station that I was, uh, 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 that I took position, he got an order from our brigade commander, the 7th brigade commander, to move south because there are a lot of tanks coming from the south in order to attack the 7th brigade from the side. The 7th brigade was able to hold position against the uh, attack, the Syrian attack, but the Syrian command uh, decided to have a, a two brigade attack at the 7th brigade and they moved the 43 brigade, Syrian brigade, from the southern part to the north. 
we didn't know that it's the 43 uh, and it's a brigade. We're talking about 110 Syrian tanks that are moving to the north. So he was asked to start moving south. He took another platoon that was platoon number one. I was platoon number three that had only two tanks and with him together three tanks and started to move to the southern part. He tried to call the uh, brigade commander of the uh, brigade 188 that was in command of the southern part. His uh, chief of operation answered and told him that, there is a, that there are a lot of tanks that are moving and since then he couldn't talk with him anymore. He understood that there is going to be an attack of many, many tanks. What he did, I don't know if you guys, you are young guys, but we were, when we were at your age, we were watching movies from the Wild Wild West, John Wayne and all the other guys. When John Wayne wanted to, to know if a train is coming, what he did, he went off his horse and put his ear on the uh, train track in order to feel the vibration. This is exactly what our company commander did. He stopped his tank on the, uh, on the road, turned off the engine, went off the tank, put his ear, and what he says, that he felt the vibrations on the road and said, oh my God. And then he decided to arrange an ambush. What he did, I was up in the hill the end of the attack uh, to, on uh, this position. So he gave me an order to move down the hill. Now remember, we were serving on the Centurion tanks. It has a metal tracks. Now driving on, on the roads with metal tracks, our soldiers were in the army six months. We were in the first training, okay? They were very, very young. We just finished our first training. My driver, you know, the tank was just, I was shouting at my uh, driver. Now, going down the hilly with four tanks. So I took position right across the uh, main road. The main road goes from south to north. So I took position with uh, the four tanks just uh, parallel to the road around 400 meters from the road itself. The company commander with the other two tanks of uh, platoon number one took position at 90 degrees, at the angle of 90 degrees. He himself was positioning himself on the road itself and two tanks on both sides. And he gave the orders like it was a regular maneuver, okay? He gave the orders like he read it from the book. He uh, arranged the area. Now, don't remember, uh, don't forget, it was night, it was dark. We didn't, have any, we didn't have any night vision equipment. The Syrian had uh, infrared. Now, when I looked back for my position, I saw many, many lights. The Syrian were driving their tanks with very small lights on the side. We call it uh, cat eyes. In order for every tank to see the other tanks, so they won't uh, collapse or go into one another. We were driving under full dark. So what I did, I told all our tanks to show the gunner to take the, the cannon to the left, show the, the uh, uh, gunners exactly where they are going to aim. Now they needed to take off the light because they couldn't see it with the light. And, and the company commander uh, gave us the order, you are not starting to, sh uh, to shoot until I give the order. The first tank was close to him around less than 100 meters. 
So yeah, this, this guy is a brave, very brave guy. And then he gave me the order to open fire. Four tanks, open fire, 400 meters, four seer and tanks, blow. Seven seconds, okay? The second shot, okay? Another four. And it was a mess. One tank started to, uh, they, some of them uh, stopped, some of them tried to move. And it took them a few minutes to understand what's going on. The battalion commander probably made a mistake. Instead of giving the order to go through and move to the north, he gave the order to take position to the left, to this side. Now, everyone turned to me and they started to open fire at me. I was only four tanks, okay? At that time, the company commander that was standing on the side opened the fire with his three tanks and destroyed everything. After an hour and a half of a battle, we counted over 42 uh, Syrian tanks that were destroyed and several other armors that uh, were around, a lot of soldiers. And uh, the sun started to, to rise. I had a very bad day position. I had a very good night position, but uh, so at that time, the company commander gave us an order to start moving to the north. I get uh, an order to get the uh, east position of the, the road. He and the other platoon get the uh, west position. The whole company was in line and we started to move to the, to the uh, north. My platoon, three tanks, I was in the middle, the sergeant in the left, the young guy, uh, the young uh, tank commander was in the right. We were uh, 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 in a line and we moved very fast. Now, the area, you don't see it from here, but there are a lot of rocks. And driving uh, a centurion on rocks, it's a hell. It's not like a Merkava tank that you move fast with a glass of tea, nothing happens. With a centurion, it's a big thing. Now, we, we saw Syrian tanks that were left over and they were still alive. Uh, in around 40, 50, 60 meters. I remember that uh, one Syrian tank went, uh, I saw him around 40 meters on my right. So I turned the, the talk to him, I shot at him, but on the left there was another Syrian around 100 meters from me that started to, to get me on his target. You know, I, I took the, uh, the handle of the talk, I tried to move, I saw that there's no way. I hold very fast the talk, but my sergeant was faster than me and, the, and from the Syrian, and he hit him. This, is, this was the end of the ambush. Now, three years ago, I decided to go back uh, to, uh, to study a little bit. I did my master's in, uh, in the university, and I looked at the battles I uh, uh, used to be in during the war. On this battle, uh, the guy that was the uh, defense minister, the Syrian defense, defense minister, he wrote a book about the, uh, about the war. His name is Mustafa Tlas. And he's talking about this ambush, about the 43 Syrian brigade. And he talks about the order that they received to go into uh, the area, to go to the north, to get together to another brigade, the 52nd Brigade, Infantry Brigade, and together to have an attack of two brigades on the side of the 7th, our 7th Brigade. What he writes about this ambush is that the 43 a Syrian brigade get into an ambush by an Israeli brigade. He didn't know that we were only seven tanks. 
Now he writes about this ambush and at the end he writes that the 43 brigade lost the battle. And, he's, and he goes into the uh, reason why they lost. He describes the, uh, the, the officers, the uh, platoon commander and the company commander, the Israeli platoon and company commanders, and he, he talks about the way they maneuver their units. That they are doing it very fast, they understand the, the battle zone, and they know how to move and maneuver very fast in order to catch the, uh, uh, the Syrian uh, uh, tanks. And he talks about the superiority of the Israeli uh, crew, tank crew, on the Syrian crew. On the other side, he talks about the braveness of the Syrian, uh, which is true. They were very brave. They didn't run away. They fought until they died, okay? And that they were breaking their heads in the wall instead of thinking and trying to understand what's going on. So this is my experience from being a, a platoon commander. Uh, my platoon, the Tiger platoon, is the only platoon in the IDF. It is the only company in the IDF, in the two fronts, in the Syrian front and in the Egyptian front, that we brought back all of our soldiers back home. And we used to, uh, to be in all the battles from day one until uh, the end of the war with no injuries. Now, a lot of people say it's luck. No, guys, it's not luck. <laughs> It's a matter of a company commander that gave the right orders, uh, uh, gave the leadership to the people, and that's why us as a platoon commander, we saw him, and this was the spirit that we gave to our people. And you know, some of you were uh, under fire, and you know what's, what it means to be the first one and make sure that people are going after you to a very crazy situation, okay? People are firing at you and you are moving towards them. It's a matter of leadership and this is what the uh, Tiger Platoon did during the 73 war. If there is any question... Okay, thank you. Okay, I would like to emphasize a few uh, things about the war itself and I will just describe a little bit of my own fighting down here near the Nafakh area where is the, uh, uh, not brigade, it's the uh, division commander that sits in Nafakh at the first day. I was reserved in the reserve unit in 679 as uh, not the same as Ronnie was or Eitan, they were in a regular unit which is a big difference. They came to the Golan Heights a few days before the war and they had the time to take the tank, prepare it to the war and then learn the area. I, I was a student, I finished the army two years ago before the war and I was at the first uh, training exercise that we made when the brigade was founded in the 1970. We have two uh, two years of preparing for fighting, but we did all this in the south, in the Negev, in the desert. I've never been in the Golan Heights before, just maybe like a high school student visiting here and that's it. I didn't know the area. But there's one thing that you have to remember. We are three, seven years after the Six Day War. The Six Day War was a huge victory and made us, made Israel from the top of the uh, politicians and the commanders of the army to the last soldier to believe that we can win everybody, anywhere, anytime. And this self-confidence was so big and the underestimating the enemy was so uh, vital, maybe said, 
that we were, we thought that we are going to win the war in a matter of hours. When we came from home, I was already a student for the next year in the uh, Technion. I, I was studying aeronautical engineering. I arrived to the uh, base and as Danone described it, it was a new base without electric light and we started to prepare our tanks. But the assumption was that we have about 48 to 72 hours of preparation, but we didn't have it. The ammunition had to be brought, brought from another base and everything was very slow and we didn't have any or the most uh, equipment that we needed, we didn't have it. At the end of the night, which means Saturday night in the morning, we have about 50% of our ammunition, but the tanks were not prepared, especially you not know, the alignment of the gunner side with the cannon. We didn't make it during the night, and we were told to go to the Golan to finish our preparation. We were not aware that the situation here is very bad and they need every tank for fighting. So we went from the morning uh, on the main road through the bridge, the Jacob Bridge, to Nafach, to the headquarters of the division, and we stood around the base very close to each other, waiting to get more equipment and getting organized. There were many tanks that they have even a cover on the main gun and were not prepared for fighting. While we were standing there, it was about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, the uh, uh, commander of the division, Puleitan, he left Nafah, he suddenly saw the tanks. We were, from my point of view, and they are arguing with me, I said that we were 22 tanks. Just imagine when Ronnie speaks about four tanks, or others said about three tanks, 22 tanks at that time was a mess, really mess of tanks, a big mess of tanks that can make the change. While we were standing, we were told that the Syrians are here on the fence of Nafah base. Go and fight now with them, as you are. Now just imagine that you are on a tank, not ready for fighting, without gun sight and cannon aligned together, and then we go to the, and the only order we get was, be careful, there are also Israeli tanks in the area, do not shoot at them, take care. And then we got into the, into this area here, you can't see the Nafak area, but we got over here, and we spread the tanks, we got to positions, we saw the Syrian, we started to shoot, I don't know who, we, we, we tried, we hit four tanks, they were burning, and people continue shooting at those burning tanks and uh, wasting ammunition. And I knew that there, we don't have enough ammunition and try to stop it, but the enthusiasm was so big and people were so concentrated on the burning tanks that it, I couldn't stop them. It doesn't matter how much you say on the radio, stop shooting, because everybody was shouting, everybody was enthusiastic to, we kill them, we, we fight them. And everybody thought that it's going to be like the Six Day War. It will take a few hours and we will finish the war. And then there was a comment that somebody said in the radio, they are burning, they are defeating and uh, withdrawing. Then part of the tanks that were on the right of me, near the base of Nafah, started to move. And while they started to move, they were hit by the Syrian and started to burn. That was a kind of shock for me. That I grow on the Six Day War saying that we are not burning. The only tanks burning are the Arab tanks. Although there were many casualties on the Six Day War, nobody spoke about it. And nobody trained to feel the feeling that we can also be hit. And we underestimated the enemy 
And for me personally, and for other people, it was a shock to see Israeli tanks burning. And just remember, we are talking about the Centurion, the British tank, but the old version with the gasoline engine, the Meteor engine, which is probably for airplanes, and the, the fire that came out of that tank with the gasoline was huge. As you hear on the film, I don't know if you remember, there was one officer, Kirosh, which was burned in the tank. I was behind his tank when it happened, and the fire was about three times the, the height of the tank. It was a big high, uh, fi uh, fire. And as we started to move, we were hit by the Syrian, and there was other thing. I was standing there, shooting my ammunition, and we need to take out from the floor, where part, half of the ammunition, even more, was under the, the floor. And as Danone said before, many of our uh, crew members were not trained to be, uh, they have a short time of training. They were uh, in the infantry before they became uh, in the tank. Unfortunately, part of them, they were my soldiers, and even I, in my uh, regular army, I trained them. And I argue with them, saying them, try to learn to be a good tank member, member crew, because in the next war that will come, I, I said it two years before the war, you will be on tanks, you have to be prepared to fight and use and you to know to be professional on a tank. And my loader could not take out the ammunition from the floor. While I was standing trying to take the ammunition, a Syrian tank came over me about 50 meters from me. I remember that it was, remember, it was noon and the sun is coming from the south just to my eyes. He came over the hill, he had the, uh, uh, the tank itself. It, 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 very uh, like a ball. The two uh, shells were open and he was about 50 meters and I can't shoot at him. <clears throat> uh, a platoon commander stood to the left of me, shoot at him and uh, the tank did not get into fire and uh, the crew, the Syrian crew, came out of the tank. I took my machine gun, it was the 05, the big machine gun on the top started to shoot after five, six rounds, it stopped working. You know, you need to have those uh, gauges to fix it, but I, we didn't have the gauges because we have we were lack of equipment and it stopped working. And I found myself with nothing. A few minutes later, I was hit. We were hit by a Syrian tank on our right. We got out of it. Now you can study whatever you want, how to treat a when you are hit and you have injuries in the tank, when you are hit, you are in a shock that you go out and try to do something. We get out of the tank, no one was hurt, but the tank stood there and that's it. Then I saw that many of our tanks were hit at that time and the, the uh, brigade, the um, battalion commander, I saw him hit it. I saw other tanks burning and many crew members left their tanks and started to move out of their, of this area. But what I want to say is that at the beginning, just after the war, even at that point, I was sure that we failed in doing our job just because we were not prepared for the war. But after that, I learned to see that we were the first um, tanks who confront the Syrian coming from Khushnia to Nafah, and we stopped them for a few hours, maybe up to up to three o'clock. Until then, as it was said, Orio, the uh, brigade commander, came from Kuneta from there, here on this road here, on this side, and started to shoot at the Syrian on the on the right side. Danon came from there and started to shoot on the other side, and they found themselves and that is what the third uh, power came on this road here where we came from and started to shoot also at the head of them. The Syrian found themselves with three forces shooting at them afternoon and 
stopped all the attack of the Syrian. That's what I understand happened on the first day. And uh, the main conclusion from this was, first of all, be professional. As Ronnie said, there is no luck, just luck. There is also a piece of luck in life, you know. You have to be smart, but it doesn't... Uh, but you need also 1% of luck to do the things okay. That's one thing. The other thing, do not underestimate your enemy. Never underestimate the enemy. Because that's maybe the uh, worst point of what you are doing. And uh, the third, remember, the main thing, sorry. Sorry, just a minute. The main thing you should remember that the uh, people, the crew, are the most and the, the commander are the most important thing that you have to take care of. And we did not have the time to organize the company as we wanted to organize with the original crew members. We just gathered the people, put them on a tank and started the war. As it was said, sometimes you didn't know what was the name of your crew members. But you, you, you have to think about the uh, moments that you have to work with people that you don't know. More than this, you have to take uh, under consideration that what was planned will not be as you planned that it will be. And during a war there are casualties, commanders are being wounded or killed and they disappeared suddenly and then you have to organize again the unit and start working again and again and again. And that's also the thing that you have to remember as military soldiers. Any questions? First of all, uh, I must say that I, I don't share uh, the views of, your, of uh, underestimating the enemy like uh, Dov. I never underestimated uh, the enemy, but this was his feeling and I, I don't argue. Uh, uh, I want to talk to you about leadership under fire, what you need. First of all, uh, you have to know as a tank commanders, company commanders, platoon commanders, brigade commander, you have to be always in the front, you have to know where you are positioned, everybody is looking at you. You don't have to speak. The people see your body language. When you see they are standing, the way you stand in your tank, they understand if you are sitting with confidence, and if you have confidence, and you transfer the confidence to the others. When I say that, it, I mean company commanders and battalion commanders. First, second, as a uh, as a battalion commander in Israel, you are in the front. It's not that you are, you know, maybe 100 meters, 200 meters back and you send the troops and you control. You are in the front. You are confronting the, the enemy. You see the enemy. You are shooting with your own gun, with your own team. You are shooting yourself and you are directing the others. You're, you're your position... And you are the first to shoot, right. You, your position is important. Where you position yourself, this is, this is the place that all the others are looking at you. And I always, always here in Sindiana, I was on the highest point, maybe the dangerous point, but the highest point. I could be, in the, I could be spot, spotted by the Syrians very easily because I was really on the top and I know that everybody look at me they look at me they, they hear me your internet you know you know the way you are talking in the communication is important if your voice is uh, trembling a little or you are really hesitating the people feel that 
So, your position, the way you're talking, and the body language. The other important thing, that I don't know if there is a training for that, but experience really can help, experience in war, is the mental strength. You as a commander, you're under pressure. And here, you are not sleeping during the night, you have responsibility. One night, two nights, three nights, you're not sleeping. You're sitting on your commander's seat, and you have to be an alert. When a brigade commander calls you, you have to, to answer immediately. You cannot sleep. I remember, you know, on the second day, third day, putting my eyes on the binocular in order to keep them open. Just like that. And in the morning, the sun was, was against us, in front of us. So it was difficult to spot the, uh, to, to spot the, uh, the, the enemy. So the mental force, the mental strength is important because you are under pressure all the time. And it's not that you have a break. It's day and night and night. And you have to take care of your people. And you have to every day to collect everybody and encourage them to step on the tank and to go on and to continue and to, to listen to you. If somebody gets into trouble, I mean personal trouble, and there, there are cases like this that, let's say, you know, uh, he, he, he came to a position that he cannot, he cannot, uh, he cannot act. He cannot do anything because he is uh, fighting, fighting. You cannot do anything. Only to try to calm him down, to talk to him. If he goes, he goes back to the tank, he goes back to the tank. If he cannot go, he cannot go. He has to relax. Some commanders even took them one or two days to get back to themselves after the first day. I had a case. I stopped in the first day one of the uh, company commanders that I knew from the army. I said, come and be my company commander at the night, the first night. He said, no, I want to be only a tank commander. He was a captain. He did one. But later on, he overcame this situation and he became even a, a battalion commander during the war. He took position and so on. So he saw the others and he, he really overcame this situation. So you are going through a, a, a kind of a, a, how you say, a, a, no, a, how you say, a, a crisis, crisis. You go, you know, through crisis, and every day is different. And again, as a commander, you have to overcome all this with your mental strength, with your belief, with your determination, and with your leadership. Because the really the highest, let's say, leadership that you can say, you have leadership, you know, as a civilian, you have a company, you are a company managing director, you are, but in the war, you are, you are the leader and, you, and everybody depends on you and you have to show yourself and even if you are frightened to overcome it and, and show strength and confidence and be strong mentality. Not always you can tell, even you train a lot, that anyone a commander, a tank commander, a platoon commander, or what, that he will hold, you know, a, he can go through such an experience. It's a terrible experience. Terrible. I don't suggest, and I don't recommend anybody, you know, to go through a war. Prepare for it, train, you know, enjoy it, but not really to have a war. Because a war, it's something, it's a disaster for everybody and uh, and for us in our uh, uh, brigade we were very proud of our achievement because it was a great victory if i was at home two o'clock on saturday in yom kippur at home 
It means all my brigade was at home at the same time. And we collected the brigade from nothing and made it a brigade and the battalions and the companies and we uh, participated in the, the war. And in the end we threatened, we threatened Damascus, 35 kilometers from Damascus. That's what, uh, you know, made the, yes, made the Syrians to ask for a ceasefire. Coming uh, closer, we, we didn't have any intention to take Damascus, just to threat Damascus. And we, we even, uh, we had our artillery to shoot at, uh, at Damascus. So it was from nothing really, for being at home after five days, a big victory after 10 days, even penetrating and, uh, and threatening Damascus. I think this is one of the greatest achievements of this, of this war. We have a lot of criticism and the media will have a lot of criticism about the war and the, the, the you know, preparation of our the brigade, the tanks were not prepared and the ammunition was there and the equipment was there and we didn't have uh, the whole equipment. Yes. In addition, and in spite of that, we won. We won. And this is what all of us, I mean, in Israel have to remember. And you, you can take it back with you. And remember, it's not the tank, it's not your gun, it's not your ammunition, it's the people. Uh, yeah, what do you say that? The people? If you want to win, you have to conquer. You have to step on the ground. It's not by, you know, pressing buttons and sending missiles. This is not the war. This is not the real war. If you want to win, you have to step on the ground and you have to to throw away your enemy, either from your country or whatever is the, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your mission. The people are the most important thing. Now, the technology, you can say everything about technology, and we are very good in technology in Israel, even with the tanks and the airplanes and the missiles you've seen. The people are the most important. You have to take care of them. The commanders have to look the same high level as the, their soldiers have to, to take care of them, but to ask for results. Results is professionalism. I mean, to, to know how to shoot ac accurately and how to, think, to, uh, to, uh, to get the target in the first round. Maximum the second round. You have to be professionals. Because when you shoot, you have to eat. If you do just uh, shoot, you know, spread around or scatter the, your ammunition, you have to shoot. Whether if you are infantry or a tank or a aeroplane, you have to shoot to kill. That's what we have to do. So you have to save your ammunition. Any questions, gentlemen? Yes, please. You need to get that rough again. Ex exactly. Sorry? Uh, do you think it'll ever happen again? It will happen again? Do you think it will? No. No. I really don't think, I don't think the Syrians today, uh, and I think for the next maybe 10 years, 15 years, they will not want, they are so exhausted after the civilian war, uh, yeah, they had for five, six years. Uh, the army is uh, really uh, got apart, and I don't think they can do something, I mean, to Israel. It's not, it's not a real threat for us now, today, okay? There are other threats. You know, the, uh, the nuclear weapon, it's a, it's a threat. Iran is a threat. Not the Hezbollah, not the Palestinians, not the, uh, it's not a threat to Israel. We can manage in any, any place. Yes, please.